my goal is to see that mental illness is treated like cancer. Thank you for joining us, and please come over now and meet our guest. Her name is Sarah Warner, and let me get my mic behind my chair. It's so uh, wonderful that you could take time out of your busy schedule and come and be with us. Um, I know, Sarah, that you're not only um, Dr. Sarah, but you're also a mother, a wife, a daughter, a sister, and a friend. But tonight we're going to investigate this Dr. Sarah part of you. And I have a question. How did you decide to become a pediatrician rather than become an obstetrician or a, a, a different kind of doctor? Well, I think I decided around my third year of medical school at UC Davis, I was planning to be a family practice doctor and I, in our third year we were able to travel. And so we would spend six weeks as medical students in different parts of the country doing different things. And um, when I had done my pediatric rotation, I was taking care of children with cancer. And I found that I really liked that field. So I wanted to go into pediatric oncology, mm -hmm. which I did end up doing. Um, and then I ended up moving here because I met my husband. But it was really because of wanting to practice blood diseases and cancer of children that I changed from family practice to pediatrics. Wow. And um, did you stay as interested in pediatrics throughout your full career uh, as a uh, pediatrician? Yes, I love children. Actually, my first night on call in the emergency room, I decided I shouldn't have been a pediatrician because it was um, a little overwhelming, uh, children with ear infections and screaming and so forth, and everyone tells me everyone goes through that, and it was definitely the best decision that I've ever made in my life. I love children, I love the people I work with, and in pediatrics, uh, it's a very hopeful part of medicine because kids are delightful to start with, and then you can do so much to help them and when you can't make them better you can you can bring out um, the most important part of them which is their their trust and their honesty and their faith in their families and themselves and so it's a great field to be in and also you then uh, develop a very good relationship with the parents because the parents are usually with them uh, in your office and uh, I think that uh, often you get to see that relationship that's uh, going forward because you probably have children for many, many years and you can watch them grow up and watch their interaction with their parents and also help with their parents as uh, different uh, situations arise. And, um, there is a lovely poem that uh, we are going to share with our audience mm -hmm. today. It's called Welcome to Holly, uh, Holland, and it's written by Emily Pearl Kinsley. So I'd like to read a wonderful poem written by Emily Pearl Kingsley called Welcome to Holland. I am often asked to describe the experience of raising a child with a disability, to try to help people who have not shared that unique experience to understand it, to imagine how it would feel. It's like this. When you're going to have a baby, it's like planning a fabulous vacation trip to Italy. You buy a bunch of guidebooks and make your wonderful plans. The Colosseum, Michelangelo, David, gondolas, you may learn some handy phrases in Italian. It's all very exciting. After months of eager anticipation, the day finally arrives. You pack your bags and off you go. Several hours later, the plane lands. The stewardess comes in and says, welcome to Holland. Holland, you say? What do you mean Holland? 
I signed up for Italy. I'm supposed to be in Italy. All my life I've dreamed of going to Italy. But there's been a change in the flight plan. They've landed in Holland and there you must stay. The important thing is that they haven't taken you to a horrible, disgusting, filthy place full of pestilence, famine, and disease. It's just a different place. So you must go out and buy new guidebooks. You must learn a whole new language. And you will meet a whole new group of people you never would have met. It's just a different place. It's slower than Italy, less flashy than Italy. But after you've been there for a while and you catch your breath, you look around and you begin to notice that Holland has windmills, and Holland has tulips, and Holland has Rembrandts. But everyone you know is busy going and coming from Italy, and they're all bragging about what a wonderful time they had there. And for the rest of your life you will say, yes, that's where I was supposed to go, that's what I had planned. And the pain of that will never ever go away, because the loss of that dream is a very significant loss. But if you spend your life mourning the fact that you didn't get to Italy, you may never be free to enjoy the very special, very lovely things about Holland. Well, I think we could probably apply that to many things in our lives because often our lives take twists and turns in different directions and we end up in places we never thought we would be or dreamed of. Uh, and in relationship to motherhood and parenthood and um, the expectant mother family uh, with this new child coming and then all of a sudden this child isn't like what you'd planned for and I don't know that we ever have kids that we plan for. <laughs> they all have their own little twists and turns and uh, characteristics. Um, how did, how did uh, you see that in your practice? Did parents ever come to you and just be like, I don't know where this child came from. He's not like me. He's not like my husband. He's a little bit like Uncle Joe, but you know, we, we don't know who he is. Did you experience anything like that? I think every pediatrician experiences that on a fairly regular basis. We, we see parents before the children are born. Um, we see the babies in the nursery. And sometimes you know from, if there are physical problems, obviously, um, a parent um, has a, a very abrupt change of their expectations if a baby's born with a deformity or, or something obvious. Um, but we see it as the child grows, um, and I've had this my, in my own family on a personal level, that the expectations that you have of a child sometimes gradually start to, um, to get eroded. Children may not develop at the same rate as their, as their other children, and um, parents may choose to ignore this for a while, but in general, if something is going on, other people begin to tell them. And, and we as pediatricians spend a great deal of time looking at normal children, normal child development, so that when a child comes in who is not following that pattern, we need to decide at what point do we let the family know that we're concerned, at what point do we intervene by doing tests or referring the child, and most importantly, how do we tell the family? Because how you tell someone really um, stays with them for the rest of their life. And sometimes doctors can do a bad job of that. I think in general we do a good job as, as long as we illustrate that we're really caring for the child and the family. Mm -hmm. But there are physical things and then there are mental things mm -hmm. and of course what this program is about is um, what happens when a child's behavior or their way that they think, the way that their brain is put together is different, whether it's a learning disability or whether it's an emotional um, or behavioral problem or a true mental illness you know, on, on the more severe side, um, schizophrenia or something like that that may not show up till they're a teenager. All those things um, 
have a great impact on the family and and our job in medicine is to stick with that family to do the best we can for the child the parents or however the family structure is and um, and that's happening more and more I think in general practice as it gets um, more difficult there aren't that many child psychiatrists around so we are called more and more to try to evaluate children for mental um, mental problems and to diagnose them and increasingly to perhaps treat them and sometimes that gets beyond our comfort zone and and uh, so there are a lot of issues for for children for their families and for the medical providers mm -hmm. So it's, it's really going into uh, an area that most pediatricians don't have a lot of training. We're getting more and more training all the time. And um, I think that most pediatricians are fairly comfortable treating um, attention deficit problems, uh, depression, especially in adolescence. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to things that are a little more complicated, um, bipolar, um, schizophrenia, personality disorders, those mm -hmm. sorts of things. Um, we network with other providers and that's very crucial. Sometimes, and, and I had a recent example in a teenager, sometimes the patients themselves do not want to talk to mental health people. If, if you've taken care of someone since they were little, they may put your, their trust in you. And so you may be that, that um, person who can guide them and eventually work with them to get them to someone with more expertise. Yes. And have you, in your um, working with children, come across any young teens uh, who, uh, in spending time with them, evaluating them, uh, realize that and have conversation with them that they, they may need uh, to have therapy or medication or something and they they don't they, they it's just not something that they want to talk about or that they're comfortable with or or that they're denying you know that they want to go there it, it mm, is yeah. yeah I think that happens a fair amount but the advantage that a pediatrician or a general doctor has is we take a thorough history, we do a physical exam, and that's acceptable to most um, patients. And if they're teenagers, they expect, if they're coming in for a checkup, mm -hmm. that we're going to talk with them and look at them. And if, in, if you've never seen anyone before and you have that first visit for that, um, and you suspect that, that they're going to need some help, um, unless they're acutely suicidal or homicidal, you can have several visits to get that person comfortable with you and, and you have more insight into them. And eventually, if people are really ready to um, accept that they, that they need some help, mm -hmm. usually you have a fair amount of success getting them to someone who they can trust. Some, some especially teenagers, have been to counselors um, especially if they've had some behavioral difficulties early on and they're kind of tired of talking to people. Yes. And so what, what I try to do is, is find out how, how are their um, emotional or mental problems be impacting their lives. Have they lost girlfriends? Have they, have they gotten in trouble at school? Um, have they, are they using substances to escape things? And if you ask the right questions, and they're comfortable with you, they'll start talking. Then if you can find out what are their goals, what, what are they really wanting, which is most of the time they're lonely, they want attention, and sometimes they're not getting that from their family. Mm -hmm. If you can say, those are good goals, how do, we, how do we get you to there, and you remain positive, and a lot of times they, ha they don't have as many positive influences as as they need, mm -hmm. um, you can become a team. Yes. And that should be the goal of any therapist practitioner. Mm -hmm. Well, Sarah, I think on, on that note, we're going to listen to Dr. Van Houten, Peter Van Houten, from the Sierra Family Medical Center. 
and uh, Michael Johnson, who works with him, and they're going to explain how they work with their folks there. I'm Dr. Peter Van Houten. I'm from Sierra Family Medical Clinic. And my name is Dr. Michael Johnson. I'm uh, at Sierra Family Medical Clinic as well. We actually work together in our integrated behavioral health program. I'm actually a family physician, uh, do primary care medicine, see everything from small children to adults. And very much our orientation is around making sure that we bring behavioral health and mental health issues into the medical setting where they're very appropriately treated. And our program is what we call integrated care. By that we mean that both behavioral health and medicine are side by side. Um, we look at the patient as a uh, whole being and uh, that everything is interconnected in terms of their health, their mental health, and also those kind of socioeconomic and socio-cultural issues that surround them. Um, we have been doing this now for about 12 years. Uh, I've been at the clinic now for about four. Uh, Dr. Van Houten pioneered this uh, effort many, many years ago. Um, and we're now uh, quite well known in California and around the, uh, the nation in terms of integrated health care. You know, one of the reasons that we got interested in this field of behavioral health in the primary care setting was we had felt 12 years ago that we were doing a reasonably good job at identifying patients who had <clears throat> behavioral health or mental health issues like anxiety and depression. And we were getting some additional training in uh, the field of psychiatry. And as part of that, we actually did a study looking at every single adult patient who came in the door. We gave them a questionnaire that screened them for depression, anxiety, social anxiety disorder, um, alcohol use, a whole a gamut of different behavioral health issues, assuming that we'd probably get four or five percent in each area, again because we already thought we'd identified so many people with these particular issues. Well, the big surprise to us that uh, generalized anxiety disorder came in at about 30 percent, that's one out of three patients, um, eight percent of patients uh, screened as being alcoholic, 28% um, of patients screened as being depressed. I mean, these are enormous numbers, and we realized how much we were missing, and as soon as we began to address these issues with patients, they were very uh, welcoming of us bringing up their behavioral health and mental health issues and having those treated. The other thing is, is that, and this is excellent because this is part of the Elephant in the Room series, is what we realized for many of our patients, the reasons that they weren't getting well and the reasons they come in with complaints that we do enormous expensive workups on and we would still not get to the reason that they had their symptoms, whether it was chronic headaches or digestive disorders disorders, often it would turn out that in fact they were depressed or anxious or had some other kind of uh, behavioral health issue that when we addressed that, all their physical symptoms went away. So this was a really watershed moment for us, a true epiphany when we realized that, boy, that medicine really is mind and body and you have to be prepared in primary care medicine to treat both because that's where people come in and seek care. And the research uh, around the nation shows that about 80% of all primary care visits have a mental health component. And by that we mean that uh, people are more likely to tell their doctor about their emotional issues and their mental health issues rather than go to a clinic, rather than seek uh, out a psychiatrist or a therapist, they'll go to the physician instead. Uh, and. Um, primary care physicians know this quite well, that now they're, uh, most of their time, a lot of their time, excuse me, is spent in counseling. And uh, you can imagine what that's like if you have maybe 20 to 30 people scheduled a day, and uh, a good portion of that, up to half of that, uh, is an emotional issue. Uh, depression, anxiety, uh, perhaps uh, other more kind of psychosocial issues, uh, PTSD, bad things happening to good people, it, it runs the gamut of different uh, uh, situations that we see. So therefore, 
given the fact that there's that much that goes on in a primary clinic, it makes a lot of sense then to integrate all of your care. Uh, the other thing that we noticed too, and I think uh, Dr. Van Houten, can, Van Houten can kind of clarify this too, is that a lot of the illnesses that people have have an emotional component related to it. For instance, diabetes. We do know that the um, the, the incidence and the prevalence of diabetes uh, of depression in diabetic clients is uh, quite high. Uh, there's almost a guarantee that along with the diabetic uh, or, or what we call metabolic syndrome, there'll be a severe depression going on, and that also has to be treated. The same thing with hepatitis, for instance, uh, and then we see a lot of anxiety disorders with COPD and respiratory issues. So they all kind of go together. Yeah, actually to put some numbers on that, if someone is a diabetic, they have about a 50% chance of developing depression during their lifetime. In fact, one thing that I've found fascinating is that their risk for depression correlates quite well with their blood sugar. The higher their blood sugar, the higher their risk for depression. And they've actually shown it's because of changes in blood flow in the brain when blood sugar levels get higher. Um, people who've had a stroke, excess of 80% of them will get depressed in the first year afterwards. People who've had a heart attack or a major cardiac event, 70% um, plus will get depressed in the first year afterwards. And the vast majority of medical providers really are not prepared for this. Um, even if you look at people in those fields, cardiologists and neurologists, they know perfectly how to handle the medical aspect of it, but <clears throat> often don't warn the patient, you know, there's this terrific chance you're going to get depressed in the next year, and this is how it may manifest. You just may lose interest in everything. You just may uh, find that you don't have pleasure in doing things that you normally would. You don't fight, feel like being social. You find you're oversleeping. Um, these can be the stealthy ways in which depression can manifest. So these are just a few examples of, and I love the, this term elephant in the room, um, that you can easily forget that there's a huge behavioral health component to medical illness. The other thing that we see quite a lot of that also underlies a lot of issues is uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, folks have trauma in their life. And the trauma can be uh, everything from domestic violence to a bad car accident. And um, oftentimes, they don't really recognize the symptoms at first. They might have a lot of anxiety, be tearful, be depressed at times, uh, have problems with their family members. Uh, and it kind of goes undiagnosed and unidentified for quite some time. Um, and we do see a lot of that uh, at our clinic. Well, we just listened to Dr. Peter Van Houten and Michael Johnson share with you about, they mostly spoke about adults that to come into their um, Sierra Family Medical Center. And we have Dr. Sarah Warner here with us, and we also know that trauma happens uh, often uh, a lot in childhood. And uh, Sarah, uh, the first time we got together, sitting on the uh, rock wall and uh, uh, discussing, sharing this time together, you asked me to look up the ACE study. And I did, and it just blew my socks off. Could you tell me um, why you feel this study is so important and share what it's all about? Yes, I'd be happy to because I think it's very important and really we all should be familiar with it. ACE is A-C-E and that stands for Adverse Childhood Experience. And I recently went to a pediatric conference uh, and an internist spoke to us. Usually we have pediatricians speak to us. But this gentleman was one of the people who, perf who did the study. And this was between 1995 and 1997, and it's ongoing through Kaiser. And they interviewed 17,000 people, and they're following those people. And basically, they were looking at about seven things, and they had to do with the experience of the person when they were young, in the early childhood years. And the questions were included, um, was there domestic violence? Did anyone in the household have a substance abuse problem? Uh, had they ever seen their mother um, 
attacked by someone in the house? Um, was there mental illness in anyone who lived in the household? Um, was there a suicide? And, and of these seven questions, if someone had four or more of these questions that were positive, they had um, a 50% chance, I believe it was, of having a major health problem. Um, diabetes, uh, a very obvious obesity, um, uh, hypertension, so many health things um, correlated with this. The reason that this gentleman spoke to us is because, he, and he showed several interviews of people, um, including one woman that he worked with for many years who was very, very overweight, and, and we're talking about 500, 600 pounds, that he helped to lose a lot of weight. And she did pretty well, and she came back and she had gained the weight. And as it turned out, he had missed the whole point, and um, she had been molested as a young child, and her weight was her defense. And when she lost weight and had been um, propositioned by someone, by a man, she immediately put the weight back on. That was how she defended herself. He had many, many examples of this. And um, if you look statistically, um, when we miss the point a lot when we're interviewing patients, as, as Peter um, and Michael have said, we, if you see someone with, with um, a chronic illness or a significant illness, we always need to ask about their early childhood because those impacts can be um, lifelong. And the implications for taking good care and protecting our young child children are high. Well, it's, that's it, you know. It's, uh, childhood is it's the building blocks. It's like the... Um, foundation of our life and if our foundation has had a lot of earthquakes if you will uh, the it, it's going to impact the way you grow up and the kind of adult you are and and how you uh, cope uh, how you react to life's circumstances and also, sometimes uh, just a normal, uh, if you the normal, whatever that is, um, just an average family can have a child who they think they know, and then one day it's someone that they think has moved into their house overnight, and would like to have you listen into um, a, 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 a father uh, who is sharing his story of his daughter. Elizabeth was about uh, 12 years old when she got sick. Um, prior to getting sick, she had had a pretty normal childhood. Uh, throw a little temper tantrum once in a while, but a very nice person. Uh, good in, uh, did well in school. Uh, got along well with people and uh, was uh, a real fun person to have in our lives. Uh, when she got sick, uh, we noticed the, uh, a, a major decrease in her grades. Uh, she started to dress differently, uh, seemed to be attracted towards goth clothing, uh, changed friends, uh, lost friends. Uh, and um, and school, her schoolwork was the the first major indicator. Uh, my wife took her to physicians to see if there was uh, you know what might be going on if there was a physical problem. Uh, the doctor indicated that she might have some degree of uh, low level depression, and put her on a, an antidepressant. I think she was about 13 at this point. Um, that uh, triggered a, a manic episode. Uh, didn't work for her. She has bipolar, and uh, a depressant on by itself uh, can trigger uh, mania. Um, took actually about three or four years before we got a definitive diagnosis, and this was after a suicide attempt, and uh, and a hospitalization at Heritage Oaks in Sacramento, where she was uh, placed for three weeks. Um, this was done at the psychiatrist's suggestion so that he could observe her for uh, round the clock and uh, get a better handle of what's going on. 
With young children uh, or with children, it's hard to get a diagnosis. It's hard to make a diagnosis because their their disease doesn't typically present like a would it with an adult. Um, at the end of three weeks, the psychiatrist said that he felt that she had um, the um, signs and symptoms of bipolar and that he would treat her with medicines for bipolar illness. And um, we started a long journey of trial and error with meds. Uh, some of the meds caused a tremendous weight gain. At one point, my daughter had gained about 100 pounds over her normal weight. Uh, as a teenager, you can imagine what that did to her self-esteem and her w willingness to take the meds. Um, we went through uh, about three different psychiatrists in trying to find somebody that could uh, not only get a good diagnosis, a good cocktail, but also somebody that Elizabeth was willing to relate to. We finally found a doctor in um, Folsom that she related to. Uh, she started to open up, and uh, and uh, he was able to adjust the meds uh, to a very good level. At about age 18, she started to um, um, stabilize, and at uh, about 20, she was ready to, on her own, to go out into the world and wanted to go to San Francisco and, and work. She found a job as a nanny and worked there for a couple of years quite successfully. Um, as a parent, the, the trauma of uh, having a kid that uh, gets sick with a serious mental illness is huge. Uh, it caused a lot of problems in our family, uh, it caused problems between my wife and I, uh, and it caused problems between my daughter and myself. Um, I felt that uh, initially she was just being uh, a teenager and that she just needed to, you know, I needed to, you know, be a little sterner with her and she needed to, you know, buck up. Uh, I blame my wife for being lenient, too lenient with her. And, um, and we had a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, turmoil in our family for, uh, actually until Elizabeth was hospitalized. At that point in time, I felt like I had a diagnosis that I could then start to believe in and uh, could get on the internet and start to read about it. Um, and we also started going to um, uh, a NAMI parent support group here in town run by Lael Waltz. And uh, for the first year, again, I was pretty skeptical about what was going on. I didn't really know much about mental illness. Uh, and I uh, sat there mostly and listened. And But I started to hear a lot of... <clears throat> similarities between other people's children and what what our child was going through and I started to uh, get a better handle uh, as to what was going on. Um, at the encouragement of Leo we took the NAMI family to family course uh, which was a 12-week course uh, designed specifically for families uh, with a, a spouse or a sibling uh, with mental illness and what we found was that um, uh, it was a very informative class. It was it was uh, handled at, with layman's language, uh, but the turnaround moment for me was when uh, the little section, the class was uh, three or four, number three or four, and it was about uh, the brain and how um, you know a chemical travels down a nerve, it reaches a receptor, it crosses you know to another nerve and goes on so it, it dawned on me that evening that if Elizabeth was having a bre uh, an idea over here like I will do my homework and I'll turn it in and for her to execute that it had to get to this part of her brain and it couldn't do so because of a lack of a chemical or a protein or a receptor uh, then how could I hold her responsible for her behaviors? And that was really my light bulb moment, that, that she could agree to things, but she could not execute them. And that it wasn't uh, her uh, wanting to defy me or wanting to bait me or wanted to, wanting to upset me, but she actually couldn't do it. Uh, and I started to think in terms of, well, if she had, had, uh, if she had lost a leg, uh, I wouldn't be expecting her to go skiing anymore, you know. No matter how much I wanted to go with her or how much she wanted to go, that just wasn't going to happen. 
Um, and so from that moment on, I was able to change my outlook and perspective about mental, mental illness and see it as a disease, uh, a very serious disease, a life-threatening disease, and start to educate myself. And uh, my wife and I started to make huge change in our, changes in our family. Uh, how we thought about um, our relationship, how we thought about our relationship with our daughter, uh, what was important, um, get it, school was no, no longer important, going to college, being a doctor, uh, you know, those things that you wish for your children because you want them to have a good life. Um, th those um, kind of had to be set aside, and we had to find new things that were important to us. And number one, it was keeping our daughter alive and creating an environment where she could feel comfortable. Um, we also... Um, through this process, uh, and it happened all by itself, um, I was able to reframe um, uh, my relationship with my daughter. Um, while she, when she was at her sickest, she was uh, uh, had a lot of anger, was very verbal, uh, and I seemed to be the one that she wanted to focus all of that on. And uh, uh, a lot of things were said and done during that period of time that uh, really wrecked our relationship. And uh, and again, I, I I see myself as the one who could she couldn't do anything about it. I could have the the changes in behavior when Elizabeth got sick were so huge that it was like we had an entirely different person living in our house. It was not the little girl that we had raised for the first twelve years, and. Um, Again, it was a, a very dark personality. Uh, she told us about dreams that she had, nightmares uh, that were awful. I mean, they were really, really scary. And I initially believed that uh, that she had really crossed over to being, you know, uh, to a really dark place and had become a dark person. And uh, it took me um, a long time to realize that that wasn't the case. And again, you, you, we, we all draw upon our experiences that we, you know, how, what our culture tells us and what our culture tells us about about mental illness is, you know, something from the movie Psycho or, or you know, something from, uh, you know, just something dark and dangerous and, and evil. And uh, so that's the first place you go to, and I think all I think that's normal. And so if you if you don't have any direct experience with mental illness, I think all of us, uh, until we we do have some contact with it, think in those terms, and that's reinforced by the media. You know, when there's a school shooting, then we immediately think, "Oh, it must have been somebody with mental illness," and it, and, uh, and 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 it's easy then to think, "Well, uh, shooters have mental illness. All people with mental illness are going to have the potential to be a shooter." Well, that isn't the case at all. And and uh, when you get to know about mental illness and you start to meet other people with mental illness, you can find that that's not at all the case. That's no more the case with with um, uh, that group of people than it is with any other section of the population. Uh, and so I think that um, that's the first, uh, you know, major piece of education that I got is that uh, that that wasn't the case. And what I found was the that the people that I met through uh, NAMI and through being in, being involved with uh, behavioral health and meeting a lot of the consumers here in our community is that they're very gentle people, they're very intelligent people, they're very thoughtful and, and uh, big-hearted people, um, but they have their illness and their illness uh, changes how they relate to, to other people. But um, none of those uh, stereotypical myths are are valid at all, as far as I can see. <laughs> and um, I think probably the, the the people with mental illness in society are are probably amongst the gentlest of, uh, of the people in our society. Well, I hope uh, you learned a little from listening to his story. He uh, is, was very eloquent, and, and 
uh, I admire uh, a father coming out and talking like that. I think that um, sometimes it's harder for men to sit down and have a conversation like that. And uh, certainly he did touch on what Welcome to Holland was all about, how in handling his young daughter and all their hopes and dreams for her. And at the end of the day, they are grateful she's alive. They don't care if she goes to college. Uh, they don't uh, care if, um, uh, you know, all of those expectations, they change. And, and you just love them for who they are and uh, support them in what they're doing with their lives and, and how they're maturing as adults. And um, Sarah, I would like to ask you about, in uh, listening to uh, Rich's story, uh, anything that he touched on that um, gave you some thought. He touched on everything <laughs> that would give me thought. I think the part about um, how it changes the family dynamics, particularly between parents, we often will see fathers, mothers, grandparents, caretakers, foster families who, who um, are affected by a child's um, mental illness and vice versa because many times, um, particularly with bipolar, schizophrenia, there's a, a hereditary component with, with attention problems. And, and so the parent and the child may be having similar symptoms. The, pa the parent may project their fears on the child. The, fi the child can pick up on anxiety from the parent. And, and so um, it gets very difficult to kind of tease out these things. but. But oftentimes, um, even though we are pediatricians, the whole family is our patient, mm -hmm. whatever form the family has. So uh, unfortunately, as Peter Van Houten said, many times you're seeing 20, 25 people in a day. You may not have time to explore all these issues, but it is critical to make the time, if a family is in turmoil, to find out what's actually going on. Because um, a child who is a challenge can tear apart a whole family. And kids need their families. There's so much research about the importance of stability, particularly in the first three to five years, and how that impacts their future uh, performance, their future learning, their future um, social relationships, and their future health. So we need to support families, and we need to find out how um, various family members are being affected. And don't you think that there also needs to be in our society a huge acceptance of mental illness uh, because our head is part of our body. And if we're having a, a, um, a brain disorder, or another term for that is mental illness, that is part of the physical body. And when we disconnect uh, and stop at the neck, we're not uh, really allowing that person to be a whole person. And no one chooses to have mental illness. It's not something that someone is all excited about, you know, um, oh goodness, you know, and they're running around telling everyone, um, I just found out I have mental illness. Uh, it's something that is kept quiet and it's something that many people are embarrassed about. They don't want anyone to know. They kind of keep it um, in the closet. Well, one thing that he touched on that I think is important, what actually got him to understand what was going on was the physiology of the brain. And fortunately, we live in a time where we're able to look at those things more. We have PET scans. We have um, a better understanding of how the neurotransmitters work in the brain. Um, we can see physically uh, changes on these PET scans, uh, which are brain scans that show where glucose is being um, used. <clears throat> and so people, um, it's going to become more and more legitimate 
mental illness just just because it isn't going to be so mysterious mm -hmm. and just like if if you have diabetes your pancreas is not functioning if you have bipolar there are certain areas of the brain that aren't talking to each other if you have a de attention deficit disorder the part of your brain that inhibits your impulsiveness doesn't quite work as well so once we once we realize that there is a physical basis for these things and that there will be more and more treatments for it um, I think that 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 separation of mind body will um, will blur more and more and mm -hmm. and uh, especially as we get more ways to treat mm -hmm. and I know that uh, because of the stigma around uh, mental illness many people that need help don't get the help they need and uh, I think that uh, definitely uh, the, the uh, biological proof, <laughs> having a PET scan, uh, having something that can then um, point to this is what the diagnosis is, is then kind of validates it for uh, a person so that they can accept it and they can investigate it they can learn uh, as much as 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 they can put their you know uh, mind to uh, they can go on to websites and learn uh, at the end of, on the credits uh, at the end of the show we will have several websites that people can go to um, NAMI uh, uh, that's uh, National Alliance for Mental Illness and it's spelled N-A-M-I, and just Google in NAMI.org, and there's all kinds of information on that website. There are personal stories, there are videos, there's uh, connections to any uh, state, in, uh, any uh, community within those states that have uh, NAMI organizations, uh, so that people can get help locally. I, I was visiting with a friend recently and her brother-in-law was having difficulties in Big Bear. So I um, told her to contact someone in the San Bernardino area. And so that's one of the websites that will be attached to uh, the end of this uh, program, as well as uh, there's one for um, Let's see now, there's, we have about three or four. I'll get back to sharing those with you in a minute. We also have an email address. It's, it's uh, TV Elephant, the number four us. Again, that's TV Elephant, the number four us at gmail.com. If you have any questions or you would like uh, any further information about today's uh, programming, just um, shoot an email to that address and we will uh, be happy to get the information for you. Another uh, one is if you go on at the end, uh, if you go Google ACE study, and that's A-C-E study um, dot com, you can uh, have a read up on what that study revealed with the uh, testing of adults and finding that their trauma started in childhood. And um, Sarah, uh, I think that one thing I'd like to touch on with you before we end the program is uh, that you, uh, in Nevada County here, uh, started a, a, a program um, that's called the Care Crisis Center. And I'd like you to talk about that and why you found that that was something that our community was needing. Well, the the there are several crisis nurseries in California. They're licensed through the state, and it was actually the Seroptimus of Grass Valley that um, decided that we needed one here. This was about um, we've been in business so about 13 years ago now, and the crisis nursery is a place we've we've been open for nine years. It took four years to get it going. Mm -hmm. It's a home where families can bring young children under six if the family has um, 
either an emergency or if they're just stressed or if they have no resources or they are in a situation where they feel like they just need some help taking care of the children. Mm -hmm. And it's all based on the importance, again, of sheltering the child in the early years that children need to um, have a stable home and this, the research shows that if they're able to stay in the home rather than being placed in foster care or emergency care that um, if you can give the family uh, the tools to get through adverse times and, uh, and help them take care of the child that those children have higher high school graduation, less crime, uh, less substance abuse, less suicide. The, the impacts of the first three to five years are, are so important. So uh, the crisis nursery serves as a place, and I can. there are examples just from the last two days from um, situations where parents need extra help, um, uh, where they can bring the children, the children stay uh, with licensed child care workers, and the family then is given resources to help if they need, if they're homeless and they need a place to stay, if they um, just need day respite. Um, sometimes people, for instance, in CalWORKs programs, um, are are trying to get back to a working situation, and childcare in the general public is very expensive, so the care nursery can provide that. Um, they provide. Um, uh, the, this, they are licensed to have overnight visits for up to 30 days and nights in a row. Um, but a lot of what happens there is the day respite. There are also uh, safe exchanges where, where families that cannot really get along can bring a child to a, to a beautiful home that's a paradise for kids. Um, and then the other parent will come and pick them up and the parents don't have to interact. There are also court-appointed visits that go there. But the whole goal of it is to nurture that child. And I just wanted to mention there's um, a blessing that I like and it's, it's in Compline. And so it's something that I say to myself before I retire each night. And, and one part of it is shield the joy, joyous. A shield the joyful and what we need to do with our kids in the early childhood years is shield them and let them have their natural joy they have it so many times it's taken away because of the of the problems of the people around them and so the care nursery is a place where that can be preserved and it is a very joyous place and that's why I work so hard there and, and it's K-A-R-E uh, kids assistance and respite in emergencies and it's available to anyone. And we will have that, uh, if someone's wanting information on that, be sure to email us at tvelephant4, the number 4, us, uh, at gmail.com and we'll get you information on the Care Crisis Center. Uh, also, uh, we're just about ready to uh, finish off uh, the program tonight. I'd like to uh, mention the following uh, programs, what we'll be covering on those. Uh, the, the next program will be on healing trauma, and we'll be uh, discussing uh, post-traumatic uh, 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 stress disorder. Uh, Post-stress. Post-traumatic stress. <laughs> yes. I, I'm, I, I'm getting it all mixed up here, but we know what I'm talking about. The next one is going to be called uh, Riding the Roller Coaster, and it will be covering the uh, bipolar disorder. Uh, after that, uh, program number four is uh, who's, really, uh, who, Whose Reality Is It? And we're going to be covering schizophrenia on that program. Uh, the fifth program is Under the Cloud, and we're going to be talking about depression on that show. And the last program uh, of the series, uh, program six, will be covering autism to Alzheimer's. And uh, to wrap up the six weeks of this um, elephant in the room, we will be having a community uh, conference um, gathering um, fun evening at the Holiday Inn in Grass Valley and uh, it will be from 4 until 9 o'clock and there will be a celebrity uh, um, 
guests. There will be uh, live music, um, and there will be refreshments. It, it will be free to the public, and uh, there will be information um, all over uh, the Grass Valley Chamber, the Nevada City Chamber calendars, and there will be uh, many ways to find out more about it in the, in the coming weeks. Um, uh, we are recording here at the Nevada uh, County Digital Media Center. We would like to thank them for hosting uh, these programs and to, allowing, uh, to allow us to use their facilities. Um, I would also like to make reference to our beautiful art here on the wall behind us and that um, wonderful piece of art was uh, conceived and developed and um, produced by four uh, folks from the Neighborhood Center for the Arts. Um, I'll give you their names. It's Robert Lee, Danny Harkins, Ben Smith, Helen Powell. And uh, they have certainly graced our stage and uh, the, the uh, Neighborhood Center for the Arts is a wonderful local uh, uh, center for people to be able to uh, develop their artistic talents. We thank you for joining us uh, on this uh, program. Uh, Dr. Sarah Warner, it's been a pleasure uh, having you here. And we thank you all for joining us and uh, join us again on The Elephant in the Room. Welcome to Fuki Cafe. I'm Ivy Cohn, and with me today is Dylan Thompson. Dylan, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Well, you've been out on the road over the last few years making public speaking engagements on mm -hmm. the topic of everything from climate change to resisting coal export terminals. Mm -hmm. That's right. And recently we've had a lot of uh, dialogues going on out there around the rapidity with which these tipping points have now been passed mm -hmm. and things are changing. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that a little? Sure, yeah. Um, referring to climate change uh, in particular, it seems scientists continually find new information, it just seems to be the trend these days, scientists uh, figuring out that what used to be the worst case scenario in terms of uh, runaway global warming uh, and climate change now seem to be the more conservative because they keep finding new feedback loops that they, they couldn't account for um, earlier on and just new pieces of information keep coming to them and uh, you know now we're looking at you know whereas it was an 11 degree Celsius rise by the end of the century now that's that we might be looking at that in 2050 or you know it's just it, things keep getting worse and so you know what I've been trying to focus on and, and deal with for myself and then also speak